Hello, my name is Glenn Hall and today is March 24th, 2021. This is the second part of a new series of mine called Passover, Not Easter. Today I'm going to continue to discuss the what Passover really means and why Christians should be celebrating Passover every year instead of Easter. Easter uh, does not occur at the same time as Passover. Um, Easter is supposed to be the day of the resurrection of Christ. Good Friday is supposed to be the day of the crucifixion of Jesus. But Good Friday does not correspond with Passover. And Passover was the day upon which Jesus was crucified in fulfillment of the scriptures. And that's why it's important for us to understand that and to actually implement that in our lives. So I want to continue uh, with um, this teaching now and we'll just proceed with the concepts of Passover and what Passover really means. <clears throat> Continuing from yesterday's uh, video, a further application of the principle of applying the lamb's blood at Passover is found in the book of Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy uh, chapter 11, verses 18 through 22, it says, Therefore, you shall lay up these my words in your heart and in your soul, and bind them for a sign upon your hand, that they may be as frontlets between your eyes. And you shall teach them to your children, speaking of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. And you shall write them upon the doorposts of your house and upon your gates, that your days may be multiplied and the days of your children in the land, which the Lord swore unto your fathers to give them as the days of heaven upon the earth. For if you shall diligently Diligently keep all these commandments which I command you to do them, to love the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, and to cleave unto him. Notice that God commanded his people to write his words upon the doorposts of their house, doorposts which have been smeared with the Passover lamb's blood. John tells us that Jesus himself is the word of God who is made flesh and dwelt among us. Paul calls Jesus our Passover. <clears throat> so, of course, the Lamb's blood represents Jesus' blood. Now, I, I want to take you uh, quickly to a little scripture in John chapter 1. When John the Baptist came, let me read what John says in verses 19 through uh, 34 in John chapter 1. And this is the testimony of John, John the Baptist. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? They asked, and he answered, No. So they said to them, Who? He's, they said to him, Who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, Then why are you baptizing, if you are neither the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water. But among you stands one you do not know. Even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. Jesus was a different caliber of man than John the Baptist. We need to understand that because there are many false prophets about now who claim to have a Christed spirit, but they still don't understand who Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, is. 
Verse 28, these things took place in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptizing. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And that's what I want to focus on today. Jesus is the Lamb of God. In Revelation chapter 5, Verse 1, Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one, no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. By the way, this is John again speaking. <clears throat> And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered, so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain. This is the lamb of God that John was talking about, the lamb who was slain for our sins. In this chapter of Revelation, it goes on, and the end of the chapter says this, verses 13 and 14, And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen, and the elders fell down and worshipped. Jesus accepts worship. That differentiates him from everyone else who has ever lived, because he is God who came in the flesh. And that's what we must understand. So, how important is it? The church has no clue. Most of Christianity has no clue. They celebrate Easter instead of Passover. Easter is a word that does not even occur in the scripture. It was made up to be celebrated upon the pagan, uh, for the pagan goddess Ishtar. And people go home from church and they eat pig. They eat pork. Now, I believe that God, that Jesus declared all foods clean and that I have every liberty to eat pork if I want to. But what kind of an insult is that? What do you think Satan was thinking when he convinced the church to change the date and then to make ham or pork their main dish? It's just amazing. When you, when you think about it. But now I want to go back to discuss this idea of the blood further. John says this in chapter 6, verse, verses 53 to 58. He's quoting Jesus. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. As the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father. So whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread, on me, will live forever, Jesus said. Now, returning to the Feast of Passover, first, the people of Israel applied the Lamb's blood, representing Jesus, to the doorposts of their houses. Later, they wrote Jesus' words upon their homes. Jesus' words because the Old Testament is the Word of God. It contains the Word of God. 
these actions symbolically and prophetically represent spiritual salvation through the blood of Jesus, which reconciles us to God. And then, moving on from our spiritual salvation to soul salvation by eating Christ's blood. That is applying Jesus' words to our lives, which brings us into the full status of being a son of God. Now recall what Peter says concerning us. He says, 1 Peter 2.5, You also, as living stones, are built up into a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Now let's look at the book of Hebrews. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 3, verses 1 through 11. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who has builded the house has more honor than the house. For every house is built by some man, but he that built all things is God. And Moses was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. But Christ, as a son over his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. If, if we hold fast. The book of Hebrews is written to Christians. Many Christians deny that because the book of Hebrews talks about losing salvation. But it's talking about your soul salvation. The book of Hebrews is about the salvation of the soul. It's not about the salvation of the spirit. So it's dealing with people who already believe in Jesus Christ. It's talking to them. It's saying you need to be careful about how you build. <clears throat> Today, if we will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the rebellion, in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works for 40 years. Wherefore, I was grieved with that generation and said, They always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Hebrews is a book about coming into the rest of God by feeding upon his words, by applying the meat of the word to our lives. Now, these passages I just read show us that even the houses in ancient Israel prophetically pointed to each of us individual believers in God, believers in Jesus Christ. We become believers when we believe that Jesus died for our sins and shed his blood for our reconciliation with God. We eat his blood spiritually when we eat his words when we assimilate his words into our lives and make them part of us. This is a progressive salvation. It begins in our most holy place, in our spirits. So we receive the earnest of the Holy Spirit when we believe, and our spirits are quickened. This is the beginning of the born-again experience. <clears throat> but then it moves outward to what is supposed to become our holy place, and that is our souls, our mind, our will, our emotions. All of our inner being is to be sanctified. The final or third salvation is the salvation of our bodies, which occurs at our glorification, our resurrection from the dead. This can only occur after we each achieve the second salvation, the one of which Paul says, work out your salvation in fear and trembling. Jesus Christ has already effected the first salvation, but most people remain in the prison of their unbelief 
and cannot begin to walk the path of becoming a son of God yet. See, Jesus has already died for everyone. Most people just don't know it. Even most Christians don't really know it because they don't, they don't really know what they believe. God guarantees all men the salvation of their spirits, although few have understand, understood this presently. Considering the following verse, which I believe irrefutably proves this, it says this. This is 1 Corinthians 15, verse 22. It says, For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Clearly it is the same all who die in Adam who shall be made alive in Christ. It makes no sense to say that this refers to two different groups of people, or to say that Paul really meant to add the words who believe in Jesus Christ as Savior after the second use of the word. For example, the church teaches it says this, for as in Adam all die, meaning all people, so also in Christ shall all, and then the church adds, all who believe in Jesus Christ as their Savior be made alive. But that's not what the scripture says. And God warns us very carefully, do not add to my words. But the church adds to his words. Now we're going to look at a couple other verses here. Just before Jesus' betrayal, he said, While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become sons of light. That was John 12, 36. In the beginning of his book, John said, quote, To all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Both Jesus and John make the point that believing in Jesus as Savior is only the beginning. That is the step that everyone must take before he can even begin to walk on the path of becoming a son of God. So, if believing in Jesus as Savior, that means putting the Lamb's blood on our doorposts, only gives us the initial right to become a son of God, what must we do to make it a reality? We must also drink that blood. We must write his word on our doorposts as well. Now, Passover, the Feast of Passover, occurs on the 14th day of Nisan. This year, that is, uh, this, it begins this coming Friday evening, which is the 26th. The tw day of the 27th is the actual day of Passover, upon which the lamb would be sacrificed. And then that evening begins the first day of unleavened bread. <clears throat> So Passover itself is eternally bonded to the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which begins on the day the Passover lamb is eaten, according to the scripture. Passover day itself was called Preparation Day. They prepared the lamb. They killed the lamb. And then they cooked the lamb. And they ate beginning after evening on the first day of unleavened bread. In Leviticus 23, verses 4 through 8, Scripture says this, These are the appointed feasts of the Lord, the holy convocations, which you shall proclaim at the time appointed for them. In the first month, on the fourteenth day of the month at twilight, that means between the two evenings, between noon and actual dusk, that is the Lord's Passover. And on the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread to the Lord. For seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall have a holy convocation. 
You shall not do any ordinary work. So that is called a high Sabbath. That was a was not the Saturday Sabbath because this could occur on any day of the week, but it was a Sabbath day because they were to do no, no ordinary work. But you shall present a food offering to the Lord for seven days. On the seventh day is the holy convocation, and you shall not do any ordinary work on that day. The Lord commanded that the Passover lamb be eaten on the night when the Feast of Unleavened Bread begins. I'm going to read now from Exodus chapter 12, verses 8 through 11. They shall eat the flesh that night, roasted on the fire, with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They shall eat. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted, its head with its legs and its inner parts. And you shall not and you shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. In this manner you shall eat it, with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. And you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. So Israel slaughtered their Passover lambs on Nisan 14, between the two evenings. Then each family roasted its lamb and ate it after dusk in the night. Since Israel's days begin at dusk, this means that they ate their Passover lamb on Nisan 15. God gave Israel detailed instructions concerning Israel's eating of the Passover lamb. Each detail looks forward to particular spiritual realities which we should understand and apply to our lives. Later, I'm going to explain these things in detail, but I want to give a brief summary of the specific requirements for keeping Passover. And I have 14 <clears throat> written out. So here, here they are. Here are the 14 basic specific requirements for keeping Passover. One, <clears throat> the lamb had to be eaten on the night of Nisan 15. Two, it had to be roasted on the fire not boiled in water or eaten raw. Three, it had to be eaten with unleavened bread, not leavened bread. No yeast in the bread. Four, it had to be eaten with bitter herbs. Five, it was to be roasted whole with its head, legs, and inner parts. In Exodus 12, verse 46, we also learn that none of the lamb's bones could be broken. Number six, no flesh of the lamb could be left until the morning of Nisan 15. Anything left over was to be burned with fire. Seven, each Israelite was to eat his lamb with his loins girded. Eight, each Israelite must eat it with shoes on his feet. Nine, each Israelite must eat with a rod in his hand. Ten, each Israelite was to eat in haste. Eleven, no foreigners... No unbelievers could eat of the Passover lamb. 12. The lamb had to be eaten in one house, and none of its flesh could be taken outside of that house. 13. Every member of the nation of Israel had to eat of the Passover lamb. 14. Besides women, only a male who had been circumcised could eat it. Strangers who sojourned with Israel who were circumcised could also eat. Now that would signify, prophetically, that would signify believed, that they were believers in Yahuwah, <clears throat> in the Lord God Almighty. Every one of these strict commands looked forward to their prophetic, prophetic fulfillment in Jesus Christ and the people who believe in him. First, we'll consider why God required that Israel eat the Passover lamb with unleavened bread. Very important to understand this. Jesus himself taught his disciples concerning leaven. One occasion occurred just after miraculously multiplying loaves of bread. I'm going to read here from Matthew chapter 16, verses 5 through 12. When the disciples reached the other side, <clears throat> they had forgotten to bring any bread. Jesus said to them, Watch and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And they began discussing it among themselves, saying, 
we brought no bread. But Jesus was aware of this, and he said, O oh, you of little faith, why are you discussing among yourselves the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive? Do you not remember the five loaves for the five thousand and how many baskets you gathered? Or the seven loaves for the four thousand and how many baskets you gathered? How is it that you fail to understand that I did not speak about bread? Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Then they understood that he did not tell them to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So here you have some understanding of the what leaven means in Scripture, prophetically. False teaching, hypocrisy. So Jesus revealed here that leaven in bread prophetically spoke of false teaching, false doctrine. In the following passage from Luke, we see that it also speaks of hypocrisy. Luke 12, 1 through 3. In the meantime, when so many thousands of people had gathered together that they were trampling one another, he began to say to his disciples first, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Nothing is covered up that will not be revealed, or hidden that will not be known. Therefore, whatever you have said in the dark shall be heard in the light, and what you have whispered in private rooms shall be proclaimed on the housetops. Remember Paul's admonition. He says in 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7 and 8, Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, a new lump of dough, a new, a new body, a new person, as you really are unleavened. When our spirits are quickened, our spirits are unleavened, our spirits are without sin. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Let us celebrate the festival. What festival? The festival, the feast of Passover. It is to be a feast, really, that we celebrate every day. Now we should be able to understand the prophetic meaning of leaven in Scripture. Jesus and the apostles used the word to describe the carnal, sinful attributes and condition of mankind. Man is a malicious, evil hypocrite who teaches false doctrine to his fellow man. He treats his brothers wrongfully, he justifies his evil actions, and he leads his brothers into companion pits of hell with his errant teachings. On the other hand, says Paul, we must repudiate our carnal malice and evil and become like Christ, full of sincerity and truth. So, what did Jesus mean when he said, The kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour till it was all leavened. Does it not seem that Jesus says exactly the opposite of what the other scriptures teach concerning leaven in this short parable? Yes, in the natural it does. And this is why Jesus spoke in parable, to obscure the truth. Only those who diligently seek him can ever understand his words or his ways. Do you realize that you and each of us live in a fully leavened, carnal body of flesh? We each have a sinful nature that remains with us until God glorifies us. Those who belong to Christ, who yearn to be part of his kingdom, all share in this current state of being. But only the overcomers, only the first fruits, only the firstborn Kodeshim realize it, and only they 
mourn over their sinful condition and long to become unleavened, just like their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The overcomers are the first to enter into the kingdom of heaven. They are the first fruits. Because they are the first to understand, acknowledge, and repent of their leavened, sinful condition. Thus they become the first to enter into an unleavened state of being, a sinless perfection like Christ. The overcomers will be resurrected, some will still be alive, and glorified at the end of the 2,000 year period from the natural life of Jesus. They will then rule with a rod of iron, which is God's law, over the entire planet Earth for at least a thousand years. During that time, they will teach the world's inhabitants the truth about their carnal natures, thus bringing to fulfillment Jesus' parable above. All of mankind who will ever enter into the kingdom of heaven will, by the time of the end of these 3,000 years, that is, three loaves equal 3,000 years. All of those people, all of these people, and at the end of that thousand year reign of Christ is the white throne judgment. At this time, all of these people will acknowledge their sinful leaven condition and seek Christ's forgiveness with humility. Thus, we can see leaven as representing a type of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Men will ultimately realize the difference between good and evil and learn to choose good voluntarily. We must all learn we are leavened that we are filled with sin and hypocrisy and false doctrine. We must come to mourn this condition and desire to become unleavened like our Passover lamb. It will take 3,000 years from Jesus' life to accomplish this. As a parable then, eating unleavened bread with the Passover lamb pictures this. And we will continue with more of the prophetic implications of the Feast of Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread in the next video. I pray that God will open our ears and our eyes so that we can hear and see his truth. And I pray also that he will fill us with his Holy Spirit so that we can do his truth. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.